Don't you want to fill the front row? Well,
He is risen. He is risen indeed. Therefore, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I'd like to welcome everyone to the worship at Brick Church on this Resurrection Sunday, in which we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord, whose life gives us life. Everyone is a special welcome to you, especially if you are a visitor today. You are our honored guest in the house of the Lord. If everyone could take a moment to sign the Friendship Register, pass it down, and if you're visiting, give us some additional information, such as your email address and telephone number. Afterwards, we have a reception in Watson Hall, so you can go through these back doors and descend the steps in a time of fellowship, of coffee, of donuts, and uh, f experiencing uh, the life of Christ together. One uh, note correction, during the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, we have listed the Sanctus. We, the words are not the words that we are singing today. So if you know the Sanctus by heart, sing along with it. Otherwise, let's prayerfully join in the choir as they lead us during that Sanctus. Let us now continue to prepare our hearts and minds for worship of Almighty God. Please stand as you are able. And please join me in this call to worship. Paul reveals the good news of Christ to us with these words. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. As we have been reconciled to God through the death and resurrection of his beloved son, then let us worship God in spirit and in truth. This is God's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Amen. <laughs>
recognizing that every day we fall short of the standard of God's glory, please join me in this prayer of confession. Almighty God, through the life, death, and resurrection of your Son, you have made us new creations and promised inheritors of your kingdom. Yet we confess that we awaken each morning with frail egos and doubt in our hearts, too timid to boldly witness to your life-giving love. By water and the Spirit, help us to live as citizens and saints of the household of God, witnessing to the life-giving power of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. My friends, hear and believe the sweetest good news, that today, this day, Christ is risen, that today, this day, the tomb lies empty, and that today, this day, all sin and death is defeated, now and forevermore. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. The risen Christ came and stood among his disciples and said, peace be with you. Then were they glad when they saw the Lord. Alleluia, the peace of the risen Christ be always with you. Let us rise as we are able and greet one another in the name of Christ. And as the congregation is being seated, I'd like to welcome the children down now for a moment with me. And the children will stay in worship after the children's sermon. A lot of flowers. Hello, happy Easter. It's so wonderful to see you all this morning, and today is Easter, and who can tell me what that means? What happened on Easter? Yes. Um, Jesus, rise from the dead. Jesus rose from the dead, that's right. And I, so I want to talk about life today. That's what Jesus has power of life over death. But I want to talk a little bit about life. What is this right here? It's a rock. Is the rock alive? 
No. Uh, is are you sure? Is it alive or not? No, no. All right, let's say no. And here, this is a pineapple, right? Yeah. So pineapples, they're alive, right? This is alive, isn't it? Yes. Well, okay. So this looks like a pineapple, but it's not a real pineapple, is it? No. So it's not alive either. If it were a real pineapple, it would be alive. That's right. There's always a proviso. I understand that. And then, what, what is this? It's an acorn. Is it alive? Yes, but it's also partially kind of not alive. It's not part of the tree anymore. But you're right, it has the spark of life inside of it. Because what happens if it gets planted in the ground? It grows into a tree which will have its own acorn. Now, Jesus is alive in a very special way. He's alive as the Son of God. He has that, like that acorn, there's a special seed of life that Jesus has. And that seed of life he has planted within all of us. And that's that part of us, like in Jesus, that because of his death and resurrection, that eventually when we leave this planet, we will go to be with God in heaven. And that's the promise we get. It's the power of Jesus to bring life to all things. Now, unlike this beautiful flower, it is here for a time, and then it fades and it goes away after a few days. But that special spark of life that Jesus planted in within, within us cannot be destroyed. And so let's put our hands together for a prayer. Five here, five there. We put them together. We say a prayer. Repeat after me. Dear God, we thank you for Jesus, whose life gives us life. Amen. Okay, you may now go back to your seats.
We have reached the culmination of our series, Jesus Answers the Headline News. Essentially, his blueprint comes from his prayer that it would be on earth as it is on heaven. His plan intends for us to create a world shaped in kingdom values, such as love, peace, welcome, forgiveness, and reconciliation. Today in our biblical passage, we turn to a familiar, rather bizarre scene. In the face of suffocating loss, Mary speaks with a man by the tomb, unaware that he is her risen Lord. So convinced that death is the last word, she cannot conceive that Jesus is right before her. But in this passage, we discover God's ultimate answer to the headline news, but for all creation. Let those whose ears hear, listen. God of power and hope, on this day we discover the risen Lord, not only in your word, but in our lives. May his presence uplift our hearts and our hopes. Amen. John chapter 20, verses 1 through 18. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went towards the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? For whom are you looking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabuni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them all the things that he had said to her. The word of the Lord. As a child, occasionally I got to hear my parents preach, and whenever my father preached, he wanted to make sure that the congregation, and maybe particularly me, uh, didn't miss the main point of the sermon. So 
at the moment of climax in the sermon, he would always say, boom, there it is, just to make sure that you got the main point. So I want you to listen today for the boom, because it's coming. Throughout these past weeks, we have been exploring the great challenges that we see in the headline news every day we open up the paper. That of intolerance, the plight of children, violence, estrangement. And all too often, these challenges culminate in an unjust and untimely death. It's why it's so hard for us to read these headlines, because at the conclusion of them, sometimes we are left with the feeling that evil can win. It's seemingly how the story ended 2,000 years ago for that Nazarene who had a vision of recreating this world into one that looked just like the heavenly one. It ended all too often as these stories seem to end, with a person of great moral courage having their life taken away by those colluding to hold on to the power that they lord over the people. It ended with his disciples scattering, afraid for their own lives. It ended with the women wailing at the cross, missing the one that had loved them and that they loved so much. It ended in defeat, solemnly, with the stone rolled up to the tomb. But only this time, this one time, this one time in all of history, the story doesn't actually end in death, but it ends in life. And Jesus rising from the tomb reminds us that he told us earlier, I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. Now, there is much more to this promise of abundant life than we might at first glance realize. First of all, in John's Gospel, life is a central theme. He uses uh, the word life some 36 times in his Gospel, one quarter of all the New Testament references. Furthermore, there are many layers of meaning, not only to the way that John employs it, but in the way the very Greek language understands it. There are three different words in Greek for life. The first is bios, and that refers to the life that we share with the microbes and the sequoia trees. It is a vital force of all that lives, and words like biology derive from it. Then there is the word suke, which refers to the life of the mind or the soul or the will of, or all of that put together. And in that we derive words like psychology. But none of these are the type of life that Jesus promises us. There is an ancient tale in which a Roman soldier, bereft of all meaning, with no sense of purpose in life, utterly disconsolate, comes to Julius Caesar and asks him permission to take his own life. And Caesar looks him over and asks a penetrating question. Man, were you ever alive? Now, of course, Caesar wasn't questioning his bios, nor perhaps even his suke, for he obviously had a mind and a will of sorts.
He's talking about what he noticed within that Roman soldier. That there was a hole in his soul. Now animals can feel pain, but they cannot feel existential agony. And that hole in our soul that all of us at one time or another experience is a realization. A realization that we were meant for something more than mere bios or even suke existence. We are meant for Zoe, which is the third kind of life in the Greek language. And for the New Testament authors, this referred to that unique and special spark of life that is part of our Lord Jesus Christ's very nature. John, when John talks about Jesus' life, he uses Zoe. And that Zoe is the same divine spark that is planted within each one of us. Critically, it's the life that Jesus died and rose again to assure for all of us. I have come that you might have life, have Zoe, and have it abundantly. And here abundantly doesn't just mean a whole lot of it. It means a superabundance, an overwhelming, powerful experience at the wonder of life. It is the kind of life that the heart of poets have captured so powerfully over the ages. Like Gerard Manley Hopkins when he wrote, the world is charged with the grandeur of God. Or Maya Angelou, you may write me down in history with your bitter, twisted lies. You may trod me in the very dirt, but still, like dust, I'll rise. And then Mary Oliver's famous phrase, tell me, what do you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? And finally, Mother Teresa, life is beautiful. Admire it. The life which God promises and means for all of us is this beautiful, poetic, and incredible life. But sometimes our ability to see it can be clouded by the headline news and the tragedies we see. Sometimes we can be blinded to the signs. It's what happened to Mary Magdalene. She was literally staring Jesus in the face. But so convinced was she that there was no world in which Jesus could come back to life. She was so convinced it did not exist that she couldn't see what was right in front of her face. It was what Jesus gave the hint to the disciples in the upper room at the Last Supper. He told them about what he would endure. He told them the signs that he would suffer and die, but that he would raise, rise again. But the disciples couldn't see it and didn't know it either. Having eyes and ears awake and open to the signs is critical in life. Some years back, you may remember a devastating tsunami that struck the shores of India and many other places in that area and took tens and thousands and even more lives. There was a people called the Mokan who have been rowing and fishing those waters for generations and generations and generations who were living much the same way they did in ancient times. And they remembered stories that had been passed down from one generation to the next. And one of these stories was about ripples in the ocean. When they were out fishing on the ocean, there was the merest sign of water passing underneath them. Now, they didn't see a tsunami. They didn't see a giant and powerful wave, but they saw the sign. 
And furthermore, they knew by this sign that it was too late to try to row to shore to escape to higher ground. And so they did the opposite of what you and I would do in such moments. We would row like mad for the shore, but instead they rowed out for deeper waters. And when the full tsunami finally came, it was just the merest tiny ripple underneath their boats and all the Moken survived that day. Our ability to see those signs have been clouded. And it is especially hard to see them when we are in moments of being inconsolable like Mary. We want to shrink from our faith. But faith doesn't happen by what is seen, but by what is unseen, and by sometimes the subtlest of signs. Just like John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, when he entered into that empty tomb and he saw the burial clothes rolled up in just such a way, that you and I might have seen tragedy, that somebody stole the body and the clothes might have dropped off. But for him, it suddenly awoken the promise that Jesus had given. Rowing to deeper waters is indeed the path we should take when the headlines and when life threatens to strip our sense of God's grandeur. The power that Christ has to assure abundant life for us all, it means a tremendous amount to me personally. For though my father still has bios, a beating heart and lungs that work and legs that move. He no longer, at least I can't see it, has his Zoe. He has been stricken with that terrible disease of Alzheimer's. And I know many of you I've experienced the exact same thing with your loved ones, with your friends, with your parents, with your spouse. And it's devastatingly hard to witness. And there are moments that when I see my father, it doesn't seem like he is there anymore. And I just can't bear to think about it. No more rounds on the golf course with pops. No more debating Karl Barth and liberation theology. Those days are gone. But then, I remember. I remember in his sermons what he so often said. God wins. Boom! There it is. God wins. And in God's victory, there are no losers. It is the promise and gift of Zoe, of abundant life for us all. Thanks be to God. Amen. Dear ones, knowing that God wins, let us rise as we are able for our affirmation of faith. Let us affirm our faith together. This is the good news which we have received, in which we stand, 
and by which we are saved, if we hold it fast, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day, and that he appeared first to the women, then to Peter, and to the twelve, and then to many faithful witnesses. We believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus Christ is the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He is our Lord and our God. Amen. Dear ones, those of us who have been forgiven much and given abundant life, love much. At this time of giving, over and above presenting our material resources before God, may we yield our very hearts and lives wholly to our resurrected Lord. With gladness, let us give to our God. Amen.
Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. According to the Gospel of Luke, after Jesus rose from the dead, he walked with two men on the road to Emmaus, but they did not recognize him. It was only when he broke bread with them that they knew who he was. Faith and understanding are not prerequisites to eat at this table. This table is for those with much faith and those with little. Those who have been to this table often and those who have not been for a long time. Those who have tried their best to follow and those who have failed. So come not because we invite you, but because God invites you. We welcome those who God welcomes. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, O God. For at your word the earth was made and spun on its course among the planets. Your hand formed us from the dust of the earth and set us among all your creatures to love and to serve you. When we were unfaithful to you, you kept faith with us. We praise you that in the fullness of time, you revealed your love by sending your son, Jesus Christ, the word made flesh to live among us, full of grace and truth. He died that we might live and is risen to raise us to new life. Therefore, we praise you joining our voices with angels and archangels and with the faithful of every time and every place who forever sing to the glory of your name those words of our traditional sanctus. You are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. He came with healing in his touch and was wounded for our sin. He came with mercy in his voice and was mocked as one despised. He came with peace in his heart and met with violence and death. By your power, he broke free from the prison of the tomb, and at his command, the gates of hell were opened. The one who was dead lives. The one who humbled himself is raised to rule creation. Remembering your mighty acts, 
we take this bread and this wine from the gifts of the earth and celebrate with joy the redemption won for us in Jesus Christ. So pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. Help us to recognize our Lord in the breaking of the bread and to see him and serve him in the world around us. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, almighty God, now and forever. And now in the words our Lord taught us to pray, we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The Lord Jesus Christ, in the very night of his betrayal, gathered his disciples for a solemn meal. But that solemn meal was meant to point to a heavenly banquet. And he took the bread, and after he had given thanks, he said, take, eat. This is my body given for you. Do this and remember me. In the same way, after they had eaten, he took the cup and he said something remarkable that would change the world. This cup is a new covenant, and it is sealed in my blood, and it is shed for the forgiveness of sins. All of you, drink of it. For as often as we do eat of this food and drink of this fruit of the vine, we do proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again in power and in glory. And just as the Lord Jesus Christ set aside these common elements, so too do we set them aside for us all. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Would you please join your hearts with mine in a word of prayer? Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us and fed us with spiritual food to nourish our souls. Your grace has sustained us. Your discipline has corrected us. Your patience has borne with us, and your love has redeemed us. Send us out into the world in peace and grant us courage to live lives of faithful obedience and constant joy. Amen.
may be seated. Remember, God wins. Boom, there it is. And that means abundant life for all. Christ came to save the world, and he did it. So let us go forth and be those signs of hope, of joy, of faith and love. Let us be that beacon of Christ's light in the world that others may celebrate and know this abundant life. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest upon us all from this moment on and forevermore. Amen.